Thank you so much. Bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Well, let's grab our Bibles together and uh, go with me to the book of 2 Kings. Let's go to 2 Kings. <clears throat> Don't worry. We're going to get you out before the Baptist today. Hallelujah. All right. Beat the Baptist to the restaurant. All right. Oh, that's right. I'm in Eau Claire. The Catholic, excuse me. All right. <laughs> They're already at the restaurant. It's too late. No, I'm just kidding. I'm teasing. <laughs> teasing. We have a saying in Minnesota that we have more Lutherans than people. <laughs> Some of you will get that on the way home. Uh, so 2 Kings chapter 2 says this, verse uh, 19. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Please notice the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground is barren. So here he says, the situation is pleasant, but the water's bad. Everyone say the water's bad. So here he says, the water's bad and the ground is barren. So the Lord began to speak to me about ministering today on the three ways that revival comes. There's three ways that revival comes. Now, some people get all tweaked out about the word revival. We've been to some churches that, you know, they get upset. We were, actually, we were in one church in Texas, and they, they got a little freaked out because I said the word revival. And the pastor said to me afterwards, we don't believe in the word revival because it's not in the Bible. I said, the word Bible's not in the Bible either. I said, youth group's not in the Bible either. How about that one? I said, children's ministry's not in the Bible, nor is worship team, nor is pulpit. So what else, where are we going to stop? Come on, somebody. Amen? So revival is an event. Actually, there are a couple of times that the word revive or revival is mentioned. Like in Ezra chapter 9, it says, give us a little revival in our bondage. And uh, which is a, a story for another time, but uh, uh, interesting. So there are a, a couple of references there too, but what we see the premise of it, both in the word of God, as well as in church history. So here he says, the water's bad and the ground is barren. That's the situation in America. Many people don't know this, but several thousand pastors every single month are quitting the ministry in America. Most of them are quitting the ministry, not because of, of just retiring or anything like that, but because of just discouragement, depression, and all of this different stuff. Come on, somebody. And the pressures in church. I remember when I was a pastor myself many years ago, I, I was a pastor in the 80s and the 90s, and, and, and I pastored both in New Jersey. I pastored in New Jersey for five years, and those are the years of the tribulation. I already went through the tribulation, trust me, all right? But uh, so then I went, and I, the last two years I was in California. And so, uh, but in those years, I, I remember when I first got saved, I was so on fire. There was such a fire on the inside of me and stuff. And, and in fact, let me even re rewind farther back. So as a young kid growing up in the Twin Cities, I grew up in the Twin Cities, born in St. Paul. My parents were divorced when I was real young. I was about three. And there was an anger on the inside of me because of this. And so this is so many years ago. And I was just crushed because of this broken relationship. And it was like a fracture that went through my, my early years, even into my teens. And so when I was, uh, by the time I was nine years old, my mother remarried and we moved to Western Minnesota in a little town called Herman. And so while we're in Western Minnesota, in this little town called Herman, population 700, um, I, God spoke to a man in Fargo, North Dakota, and said, I want you to go to this little town called Herman, and I want you to start a Bible study for teenagers. He said, God, I don't even like teenagers. But the Lord said, I want you to go and I want you to start this Bible study for teenagers. And so he went and he came that summer. I was uh, 16 years old and he began to uh, minister in my town. And as he did, um, a bunch of kids got radically saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit and stuff. And, 
And so I began to persecute them, me and a few other guys. And, and just because of this anger and bitterness and everything else. And so I, I went and we used to rip their Bibles up. We would record demonic music over their worship music. I was wicked. All right. Before Christ. Okay. So I went in and we would persecute these kids. And one week the youth pastor began to challenge the kids to pray for the worst kid in their high school. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, seven days later, he'll be saved. And so I guess they, I guess they picked me. And uh, so four days later, I was in another town called Morris, Minnesota, and I was getting in trouble with my friends again. And I see this kid walking across the street, and I know him from my school. And so I just stuck my hand out to shake hands with him. And when he grabbed my hand, he was a baby Christian. He wasn't even a month old in Christ. So he couldn't give a, a gospel presentation. And so he just knew that he was praying for me to be saved. So he goes, Tom, you're going to hell. Pray this prayer. <laughs> That's all I got. You're going to hell. Pray this prayer. <laughs> nothing God loves you. Nothing nice. Just the ball peen hammer ministry, right? And uh, so standing in the middle of the street, I wasn't saved in a church. I got saved in the middle of the street. He grabbed my hand. As, as he's telling me this, he starts praying. He said, pray this with me, dear Lord Jesus. And that's all I remember. And the power of God hit me on the top of the head and went through my whole body. And I felt the anointing of God pushing that anger out of the bottom of my feet. And I was instantly delivered. And so that's when my journey began. And my very first Christian books my spiritual mom gave me was uh, T.L. Osborne, Healing the Sick. And, and from Texas, uh, The Happy Hunters, uh, one of their books as well, Angels on Assignment. And so I began to read these books and it was just like a, a fire and a hunger on the inside of me. And, and so this hunger began to grow. And so as this hunger began to grow on the inside of me, I went and I heard my friends speaking in tongues and I said, well, I want that. And they said, well, this guy came and he gave it to us and we don't know how we got it. <laughs> I'm like, well, you guys are worthless. What the heck? I mean, you got it and you don't even know how you got it. Yeah, that's, that's it. And so they said, he's from Fargo. You got to go to Fargo because that's where the Holy Ghost lives. This is what their theology was, okay? So it was really kind of skewed. So they're like, that's where the Holy Ghost lives. You got to go to Fargo. That's where, that's where you can get it. And so I had to convince my unsaved parents for four months to let me to go to a Holy Ghost Assembly of God church in Fargo to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Finally, after four months, my parents said, okay, you can go. And so um, I, I went and I was so excited. I was reading this book from Kenneth Hagin on what faith is and stuff. And so I'm like, okay, the moment they lay hands on me, I'm going to be filled with the Holy Ghost, you know. And so all the way there, 100 miles, I drove away. I just kept saying, Lord, you got one shot. You got one swing. I can't come back. I'm coming to get the Holy Ghost because this is where he lives. And so sure enough, that night, I was uh, uh, probably about 2,000 people in this church. And so we were in the back of the church and we got lost and we finally found it. And so the pastor went and said, I heard people want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I mean, phew, I mean, I was the first one down there, right? I'm standing like this. I'm ready to receive. He said, no, you got to go to this upper room and, and receive it. And so all my friends came with me and and so as the pastor starts reading the scripture, it'll come to pass in the last day, says, God, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. As, he sa as he's reading those verses, I start speaking in other tongues, and this fire of God began to burn and bellow on the inside of me. Come on, somebody. And I was on fire. And I became this little evangelist in, in, in high school, and I was preaching the gospel in class. <laughs> I went from ripping up their Bibles to bringing mine and preaching out of mine, and, and went from, you know, this total anti-God to totally on fire, and this is all I want to do with my life. And I went to Bible school at the age of uh, 18, and by the time I was 20, I went and I was working for Jim and Tammy Baker at PTL at a, a, a like a teen challenge, and, 
And by the time I was 21, I was a youth pastor, an associate pastor, and then a senior pastor before I was 24. And I planted my first church outside of uh, uh, New York City, right outside of New York City. And David Wilkerson gave me my first three families uh, to start my church. Some more Texas connection, right? So anyways, long story short, I, I went and, and I, I couldn't understand church. I couldn't understand apathy and lukewarmness. I couldn't understand it. There was just, no, I never could understand that. You know, Jesus gave his all and, and some people want to give just a little bit. I just couldn't understand. I couldn't fathom. I couldn't grasp it. You know what I mean? And so, so here I am even as a pastor, you know, preaching about the fire of God, preaching about revival, preaching about the outpouring of the spirit and all of these different things. And so, um, I went and in 94, uh, with 93, God spoke to me to transition out of pastoring into the traveling ministry. And, and the Lord began to start to minister to me by his spirit through uh, a guy uh, connected to Rodney Howard Brown's ministry out of uh, Tampa. And I was drunk in the Holy Spirit in one service. And I was so drunk in the Holy Ghost, I was there laughing under the Holy Spirit for about seven and a half hours. And I mean, I was just bombed out of the Holy, I mean, just, just completely wrecked by the spirit. Come on somebody. Amen. And I thought I was on fire before, but man, oh man, just everything just took off from there. But I began to realize that what my calling really was, was to stir the church for revival. That's really my DNA is to make you mad, sad, or glad. One of the three. All right. <laughs> So to be honest with you, I, I rarely do this. I rarely minister in a church. You look on our itinerary, I rarely speak in a church for one, one day. I, I mean, you look on our itinerary, I don't think there's any times for the rest of the year. I only do week-long revival meetings and hope that it goes for weeks and months. And Come on, amen? I mean, remember one time we were in, uh, ministering in Canada and we had this uh, little revival breaking out in Toronto. And uh, this pastor heard about us uh, uh, in a city called Sarnia. And so he invited us. Funny enough, they were on a 21-day fast. And on the 21st day, I came to speak on that first service, and it exploded. In that meeting, we had six deaf people here, completely deaf. And the place went crazy, and people were laughing and drunk in the spirit, and some are weeping in the altar. And the meeting went till like 1 in the morning that night, and it was just crazy and we ended up being there in a revival in that church for 13 months and uh, we literally stayed in that church all of 2006 and most of 2007 and so God moved but we began to start to see these principles I'm going to share with you today so here in the first principle is here it says at the water's bad everyone say the water's bad and the and the ground is is barren Okay, so in other words, the ground can't produce anything. Religion can't produce. Come on, right? Uh, only life can produce. So, and he said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. And so they brought it to him. And he went out to the source of the water and cast salt in there and said, thus says the Lord, I've healed this water and from, from it there shall be no more death or barrenness and the water remains healed to this day according to the word of, of, of Elisha which he spoke. So the first principle, the first thing of how do you get revival is you get somebody who's got a revival in their ministry and you have them throw salt in your river. Come on somebody, Amen. You get them to throw salt in your river. You get them to throw salt in your river. It sounds like that's kind of what Pastor Landon has in his heart for this year for, for Eau Claire. Come on, right? Is that somebody to throw salt in the river? Throw salt in the river. You know, but some preachers, they, they can preach, but there's no salt to throw. Are you, are you with me? They're, they're shooting, but they're shooting blanks. You right? You understand? And, and, and that's why I believe that the Lord is raising up a new breed of, of evangelists as well that literally aren't just coming with a golden oldie sermon, but are actually coming with a revival that will transform a church and transform and completely transform an entire community. Amen? So praise God. So number two is we're going to jump over here to chapter five. Second way. 
revival comes is in 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. All three of these are in 2 Kings. It says, now Naaman was a commander of the armies of the, of, king, uh, of the king of Syria, and he was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because by him the Lord had given great victory to Syria. And he was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone on raids, and they had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who's in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. He would heal him of his leprosy. This is one of the first times we see that is, is what does a prophet do? He brings healing. Now, it's, it's hard for us in America. When we think of a prophet, we think of prophecy. But yet Jesus was called a prophet and never prophesied. What did they call him? They called him prophet. Again and again, throughout the, I think five references in the entire gospels, prophet, prophet, a prophet is not without honor, a prophet, a prophet. Five different times he was called a prophet. Is that right? And so, but yet a prophet would bring healing. That's why you go to parts of Africa where we minister. We minister in Uganda and Tanzania and, and uh, Kenya and, and, and Nigeria and South Africa and Lesotho and all of these different places. And the first person that gets healed, they call you prophet. I mean, it's in them. They understand that. Amen. So this is what she says. I wish the, she, he, uh, he, Naaman would go to the prophet and he would bring him healing. Okay. So as you keep on going, just for time's sake, go all the way down to verse, uh, um, verse 10. And Elisha sent a messenger to him and said, go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. And Naaman became furious and went away. And indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand, call on the name of the Lord his God. Here's his religion talking now. Surely he's going to wave his hand and trill his voice and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. So now he's complaining about the word that, Eli that Elisha gave him. Elisha said, go dip. Here's the second principle of revival. How do you get revival in the church? The second principle is go dip in someone else's river. Go dip in someone else's river where there is a fire. Now this is the hardest one for most ministers. I've, I remember years, years ago when we were having revivals breaking out in church, I remember one pastor said to me in, in Indiana, he said, God can just do it here. I said, well, of course he can do it here. And he said, well, God is everywhere. I said, yes, true, God is omnipresent, but he's not in manifestation everywhere. Is God present even in a, a, a house of prostitution and in a, in a, a, a drug, drug den? Come on, somebody. A crack house? Of course he is because he's omnipresent. But is he in manifestation? No. See? So just because God is there doesn't mean that he's in manifestation. That's the difference between a revival and just good church. Come on, somebody. There's a lot of good churches in Eau Claire. But they're not having manifestations and the outpouring. Come on. Right? And so it's, it's, it's like, you know, a, an outpouring of the Holy Ghost is like drinking from a fire hose. You understand? And so, <laughs> and uh, that's what happened. Now, now let me just kind of give you some, some church history here. So in... Um, in American history. So in the 1750s, what was called the, the Great Awakening, the Great Awakening in the 1750s. Then the 1800s was the Second Great Awakening. Then, you know, so the 1700s, you have John, John Wesley and George Whitfield and uh, Peter Cartwright and all of those guys. And, you know, many people don't know this, but George Whitfield was so used in that revival. The only reason we have in God we trust on our money is because of his revival. And he was best friends with Ben Franklin. And Ben Franklin knew he was a man of God. And he said, we, we need to do what he said. Because George Whitfield said, put in the money, in God we trust. And God will bless even the money. 
Come on, amen? But that all happened in the revival. So then the 1800s, then, then we have the 1850s. We have, uh, uh, um, you know, the Cane Ridge revival, and we have uh, 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 Charles Finney and, and the, the revivals up in New York. We've ministered there. We've been to Rome, New York, where the whole city got saved. May it happen here. Yeah, all the bars shut down. I, we've been to that city. We've been to that town, okay? And we've ministered in that area. We actually had a revival breakout in Syracuse. And uh, so, which is not that far from there, really. But um, then we have the early 1900s. We have the uh, Topeka outpouring. So the first people were baptized in the Holy Spirit in Topeka, Kansas on in 1901, January 1st. 1901, January 1st, 44 people baptized in the Holy Ghost, Topeka, Kansas. Then the fi we wrote a whole book on it called The Fire That Could Jump the Ocean. Then, then it jumped over and it went to Wales in, in uh, Europe. So then it went to Wales in 1904, 1906. It came back to a place called Azusa Street. Is that right? So Azusa Street, phenomenal. God moved three meetings a day, seven days a week for three and a half years. People went there and dunked in that river. God showed up. Then we have the 1950s. We have the, the, uh, the healing revival of the 1950s. And then it was like God sped time up, and the 1990s came, and bam, it hit America 10 years early. And God did something unusual that he had not done in 250 years in American history. And all of a sudden, it sped up. It wasn't every 50 years. Now, it was 40 years later. And God moved in a place called Pensacola. The Toronto Blessing, obviously, in 94. The Pensacola Outpouring, 95. There was more visitors in Pensacola's revival than any other American revival in American history. 1995. Three times the size of Azusa Street. Three times the size of Azusa Street. We were sending pastors and preachers and whole churches. There was a church in Minneapolis. The pastor emptied out the church bank account, emptied out the building fund, and said, we're either going to have a revival or we're going to close the doors. And he literally flew the whole church there to the revival for 30 days. And they went to the revival for 30 days, for 30 days of revival meeting. Come on, somebody. Because he was dipping in somebody else's river. Come on. He was dipping in somebody else's river. Why? So that he could go and, and see it come take place. And then we, we had that in St. Paul uh, as well in the late 90s from that. So, so the, the second way that God does it is, is there's dipping in another man's river. That's the hardest one for most people. Why? Because it's humbling yourself. I said, it's humbling. Is that right? Where you have to be willing to go. And I, I mean, I can tell you uh, my, myself uh, uh, again and again where God has touched me in, in, in these revivals. I went to Pensacola. I went to Toronto. Toronto was really more for the evangelicals to get the baptism of the spirit. That's really what it was. But Pensacola was like a fire hose, like a wide open fire hose. I mean, it was unbelievable. And, and I could tell you, when, when I, I went, the power of God hit me, and I wept uncontrollably the first time uh, for four and a half days. I never stopped weeping for four and a half days. And just God totally transformed me. After that church came back from uh, Pensacola and, and, and for 30 days, I ministered in that church. And in that first meeting, I just literally fell in the altar, just weeping uncontrollably. I couldn't stop crying. I told the pastor, you got to preach. I can't preach. He said, don't worry. It'll lift for you to preach and then it'll hit you again. That's what happened to us too. Come on. Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, some, the, the part, one part of revival is where we go and we begin to let the river get in us. John G. Lake said this 100 years ago. There was a man that died and he raised him from the dead. He had drowned in a river. And when the man had drowned in the river, John G. Lake had raised him from the dead. That man came back to life and he starts coughing up all this water and stuff. And he said, that's the difference between most of you here and him. You all got in the river. He let the river get in him. 
But see, that's the part of revival. Some people are like, yay, little golf clap, you know, yay. Let's have revival, Pastor Landon. Just one day a week, that's perfect for me. But they don't realize that you're literally asking God, come on, somebody, to totally take over everything in your life and everything in your week. Come on, somebody. Never in world history of 2,000 years of revival, I've, listen, I've studied it, there's no such thing as a one-day-a-week revival. It's, you're just never going to find it. Come on. Never in 2,000 years of church history has that ever happened. It's always an overwhelming thing. I mean, Pensacola met five days a week of revival meetings. In Smithton, the Smithton revival in the middle of a cornfield in, in Missouri in a town of 532 people. They didn't even have a stop sign in their town. That's no lie. I didn't even have a stop sign in town. They went and they went f uh, five days a week themselves. Five days a week. Can you imagine going to church five days a week? Now, we're not talking about a dry cleaning service in by seven and out by eight. <laughs> we're talking the meeting starts at seven and doesn't get over until midnight. My wife was totally transferred. I wish she was able to be here today. She would tell you her story. And, and it, was, it was awesome. I mean, she was going to a church in the Twin Cities. And, and I, I didn't know her at the time. This is 1998. And she went and, and in this church in the Twin Cities, they had a, a big uh, church fight. People, you know, started saying things that weren't very nice and stuff. And, and she was a baby Christian. She was fairly new in the Lord. And she got kind of thrown into this church fight. And in the midst of it, she got thrown in the middle of it. And she, she's like, I, I don't even want anything to do with this. I just want to serve Jesus. And she was so broken that she didn't even want to go, um, go to church anymore. So a lady that she used to go to church with, but she worked with every day, said, I just came back from the Smithton Revival, and my life has changed. I paid for you to go with me next week. We're going to go, and we're going to take three days off, and God's going to do an amazing thing. My wife is like, I'm not trying to go to more church. I'm trying to go to less, <laughs> you know? And so this woman said, just come with me and watch what God does. And my wife had gone through a, a broken home as well. Her parents were divorced and stuff and, and a real ugly situation. And so uh, she went and she went with her friend and they get there and the lines were wrapped three lines around the church to get into church in an old country church uh, that was over 2,500 people lined up around the church trying to get in. And she said, I took one step over the threshold and the power of God hit me in the, in the entryway. And she said, I fell under the power walking into the church, weeping and going through deliverance right there. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> and just like me, I didn't even know her at the time, but just like me, she just wept for four days nonstop. She said, I just couldn't stop weeping. God was cleaning me out and healing me of all of that trash. Come on, somebody. Amen. But it's dipping in somebody else's river. Everyone say dip in someone else's river. Okay. And the, and the third way is over in 2 Kings 3. So 2 Kings 3. Now, I'm not going to read all of it, but the first... Um, the first 11 verses, it talks about the king of Judah and the king of Israel and, and, and Jehoshaphat. And, and it talks about all of these guys and, and they, uh, uh, the king of uh, uh, Moab, no, it was king of uh, Edom, excuse me, the king of Edom. So the three kings came together because they were outnumbered by the king of Moab. So the king of Moab was about to wipe out these three kingdoms, Okay. So as they were going to take out the three kingdoms, number one, they had no water for themselves or for their animals. So they're all dying slowly. Number two, they have no food. Number three, they're outnumbered about 10 to 1. And so they said, go and inquire the prophet Elisha. So Elisha picks up here in verse 15. And he said, bring me now a musician. And it happened that when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, thus says the Lord, 
make this valley full of ditches. Can you imagine? You're in the middle of the wilderness, <laughs> and God says, dig a hole. I mean, what a stupid prophecy. You know, everyone comes home that day, and the wife says, honey, what did the prophet say? Yeah, he said something really stupid. He said, dig a ditch. Dig a ditch. Yeah, dig a ditch. Dig a hole. So now watch this. So here's what he says. Dig a ditch. Make the valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind. You shall not see rain. Yet the valley will be filled with water so that you and your cattle and your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. And he'll deliver the Moabites into your hand. So now watch this. So here's, here's the crazy part. So the crazy part is this. What they did not know is when the prophet was giving the word, it was raining on the other side of the mountain. So had they not prepared, they would never have caught revival. So number three is prepare for revival and dig a ditch. Come on, somebody. Everyone say dig a ditch. So the third way that revival comes is that you have to prepare for it. Everyone say prepare. So there's something about preparation that does that. Amen. Amen preparation that brings and, and is a, a place where God can pour out. You know, uh, John Gilpatrick of the Pensacola Revival said this. He said, the reason that God doesn't pour out his, his uh, uh, revival in most churches is because they don't have a net big enough to catch what God wants to do. That's the, that's the problem. And so, so that's why he was saying, make the valley full of ditches. That's the one thing I've noticed that God says, listen, get things prepared, prepare. Can you imagine? What if you had 2,500 visitors every single night of this week? <laughs> now, that's just visitors. I mean, that's a lot of toilet paper, people. You understand? <laughs> that is a lot of visitors. I mean, somebody's going to sit in your seat, sweetheart. I'm telling you, you're probably not going to have your seats. Come on, right? But it takes preparation. In other words, just like Jesus said, seat the people in groups of 50. Remember? He didn't just feed the 5,000. No, there was preparation in it. Now, the last church I told you I pastored was in California. It's in a city called Modesto. And so there was a, a pastor there that was retiring. And so he hired Jimmy Swaggart's youth pastor, Glenn Berto. So Glenn, I met Glenn, and he told, told us the whole story. And so in, I think it was 95, uh, somewhere in there, 96, he went and he started telling the church, get ready, revival's coming. Oh, they said, oh, that's great, pastor. He said, no, that's not. That means you all got to get to work. He said, we got to prepare. We're not ready for it. If God poured it today, we'd lose it all. Can you imagine? What if the water came over the mountain into Israel and they had no ditches there? They would have had nothing to drink and the, and the enemy would not be defeated. They had to dig. They had to prepare a place for that water to go. They had to prepare. They had to prepare it, right? And so Glenn told us this story. He said, so what happened is I started telling the people, we're going to prepare for 18 months to bring in a guest ministry. And they said, Pastor, listen, you know, <laughs> we have a lot of guest ministries here. He said, no. He said, you see a cloud the size of a man's hand. I hear the sound of abundance of rain. And he said, we have to prepare for what God is about to do in our midst. And so for 18 months, they repaved the parking lot. They trained catchers. They trained altar workers. Come on, somebody. They trained prayer warriors. They, they trained people uh, for discipleship and everything, every kind of aspect, people to park the cars and all of this different stuff. For 18 months, they prepped and they prepared and they brought in something called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames for three days. And three days ended up turning into 33 days, which ended up turning into 40,000 salvations. 40,000 decisions for Christ. And he showed me the stack, Pastor. It was this high of names. This high of names of people that received Christ. And he said, there's no way our church could follow up because we weren't prepared for that kind of an outpouring. And so he said, I'm giving 500 names to every spirit-filled church in Modesto. 
Because we prepared, they'll reap the harvest. Come on, somebody. So that year, every church, every Holy Ghost-filled church received because one church prepared. Amen? And many people, you know, glorify today Smith Wigglesworth and others glorify, you know, A. A. Allen and all these people from Texas, right? They glorify, you know, William Branham and all of these different awesome men of God. Jack Coe was, Jr. was a great friend of mine and a uh, Dallas guy. And uh, so all of these great healing evangelists, how many of you ever heard of some of those names, right? Did you know this? That none of them would pray for you in the first meeting. You had to be in three consecutive meetings before they would pray for you to be healed. Well, it got quiet at the Presbyterian church this morning, didn't it, huh? <laughs> Put that in your pipe and smoke it, huh? How about that one? Can you imagine? You got to go to three meetings before you get prayer. Come on, somebody. Because what they found is, is that the ground was not ready to receive it yet. And uh, there's a lot of laying on of hands, come on somebody, and a lot of people not receiving and a lot of people frustrated from it. Amen? So that's where it comes in that preparation, 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 preparation. In 2007, we did a big conference in, in Florida. We used to live in Florida. And so in 2007, we brought this large ministry in. And so the two of us were on God TV and we did this thing. It was like, I don't know, a few thousand people came to this conference. And so God TV said, would you do this again next year? I said, sure, we'll do it again, but we're going to do it in Fort Lauderdale where we live. That's where we used to live. So I said, 2008, we'll do it in Fort Lauderdale. We'll have the whole thing together. So we were going to do this same conference. So in 2008, at the last minute, the church we were going to use in rent raised the rates to $10,000 a day rent in 2008. Yeah, can you believe that? And so we were like, well, we can't afford that, you know? So we had to cancel the conference. So anyways, long story short, we set them up at a church in a city called Lakeland, Florida. And the first week it exploded into like a mini revival. Roy Fields, a worship leader, is a close, close friend of ours. And so anyways, um, so Roy calls me up and said, Tom, you gotta come up here. You gotta see what God's doing, man. This thing has exploded. So I get up there and they said to me, they said, so what do we do to take it to the next level for this thing to erupt? And I said, well, what you have to do is you have to prepare something in the people. Number one, we have to prepare them before even the word comes. So everybody collectively during worship comes down to the front. Everybody comes out of your seat if you want to see revival. Come on, somebody. And comes to the front to worship. Just like you came to give of your offering this morning. Come on, somebody. You come to give of your offering. Because some people sit in their seats holding on to that seat in front of them like they're on a ride at Disney World. Right? And they're hanging on, their knuckles are white. But when you come down here, there's nowhere to put your hands. <laughs> come on, right? So you want to see it, that's what I said. Get the people out of their seats, get them down to the front. I, I just stopped the worship service. I just jumped up, I said, stop. Everybody come down. There's about 700 and some people. I said, come, come on down, quick, run down here. Everybody, and let's just worship. And for an hour and a half, we worshiped. I mean, everybody's weeping, bawling and stuff. I mean, you could have, you know, you could have said twinkle, twinkle, little star and they would have fallen out. <laughs> it wouldn't have mattered what you said. Why? Because the ground was prepped. <laughs> Come on. Why? There was a preparation. I said there was a preparation. There's a preparation to revival. Amen. You have to prepare for what God wants to do in your midst. Amen. That's what I believe that the Lord is about to bust, lo bust loose right here in, in Wisconsin. Could I get the, the worship team to just help me? So I was ministering in uh, Wausau. Help me, Wausau. Which way? Thank you, brother. <laughs> Wausau. 
So I was ministering in Wausau about, uh, about six months ago. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord come on me, and I began to prophesy. And I began to prophesy six months ago. Now, I didn't even know your pastors then. We never met, never even heard of each other, nothing. So I'm ministering in Wausau, and God speaks to me and said, the spring is the time for revival in Wisconsin. So I began to prophesy to that church. I said, you have a narrow window to prepare because the water's coming, sister. And if you're not ready for it, you're going to miss it. And so that prophecy that I shared in that church in, in Wausau has been going all over. In fact, Pastor Yalko and stuff and Leslie, and, and I, I was sharing it up there a little bit as well when we were there ministering, that the Lord just gave me that word that this spring, come on somebody, springtime is going to be a revival Holy Ghost blowout here in the state of Wisconsin. So I really believe that you are literally on the verge of a mighty breakthrough. Come on, somebody. Like you've never seen before. So that's why it's supernatural. It's, it's God, it's the Holy Ghost that you guys are on a fast for the next 21 days. That's a part of preparation. I said, that's a part. That's not all, that's part. That's part of digging your ditch. But part of digging your ditch today is you have to dig a ditch of expectancy and say, make, make a commitment, make an altar to the Lord. Lord, I'm not going to miss it. I'm not going to miss it because of I'm tired. Come on, how many of you think somebody in Azusa Street in, in, in 1906, how, how many of you think a couple people got tired after three and a half years? But you know what they said? You know what they said? We're not asking our flesh if we're tired. We need to be there. Our hunger needs to be there for somebody else. That's what they said in Pensacola. Amen. That's a part of digging a ditch. Everyone say, dig a ditch. Come on. That's, that's where God is just prepping you. He's, God's going to do something in some of your family members, some of you on your work. I'm telling you right now, there's Tom Scarella on your work. I mean, he's probably the most ornery guy anti-God guy, but that's the one that's going to get saved. He's going to be a little evangelist right there. Come on, somebody. Amen. And that's where I believe the Holy Ghost is going to use this body of believers through what? Through preparation. We're going to prepare. We're going to prepare. We're going to prepare in our, our, our worship. God, we're going to give our all Come on, somebody. Amen. We're going to sing with all our hearts. I mean, if you can smack your gum while you're, pre you're singing to the Lord, then that's not your best. Come on, man. I'll tell you a story. So I have a son. Now he's 32. Makes me feel old. But <clears throat> when he was a little boy, he traveled with me and stuff on the road. Long story. He, uh, he was about, uh, he was probably about 12, and he got girl crazy. So we would go to different cities every week, you know, and so there's always a pretty face in every city. So, so we would go to the church and stuff, and so he was at that age where they would want to play basketball. He wanted to play basketball, and I knew it was, you know, to show off and stuff, so I'm like, okay, whatever. But I'd say, you're going to be in church on time. You're not going to come waltzing in late because you guys are out there, you know, playing. And so he's like, no, no, Dad, I'll be in. I said, okay. So he was about 12. So Susie and I were married and, and for many years by then. And, and so he, uh, <laughs> he went and he was sitting, uh, excuse me, uh, she and I were sitting there. And I looked back and I said, is he here yet? And she said, he just walked in. So service just started. Right? So the worship leader is leading. So as she's leading worship and stuff, all the youth have their hands on the chair in front of them. And they're like this. And they're kind of rocking, you know, like this. And so at the end of the service, I said, son, I want to talk to you for a minute. I want to parent you. He said, what, dad? I said, do you think God's stupid? He said, no. 
I said, do you think he's pretty smart? He said, yes. I said, do you think he gets signals? He said, yes. I said, so when he saw you sweating, screaming, jumping, falling on the ground and everything else out there on the basketball court, he saw that? And then he saw you come in here bored out of your head. And he said, ouch. I said, do you think he saw that? He said, yes. So I said, listen, son, we don't give the world our best and give Jesus scraps. We give Jesus our best, right? And we give the world our leftovers.